My name is Ash Alawalia. I am a product manager for the Google Cloud platform, uh, and I work on transfer products, uh, products that help uh, customers get data from wherever it is into the Google Cloud. And we primarily have, for this session, three big goals. One is uh, to help you understand, how do I get started on uh, a big transfer project? Two, uh, what options does Google have available, and how do they work? And then three, uh, what are some best practices that I can employ uh, so that I can have a successful transfer initiative? So those are the three things we hope to cover here. Um, so to start with, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the mission of our transfer product suite. It aligns really well with Google's mission to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. From the transfer perspective, what that means is we want to make sure that your data is delivered where and when you need it so that you can make it useful for your workloads and for your business. Now, there are a lot of different applications uh, of your data in Google Cloud. You could be running an analytical workflow. Uh, you might be uh, archiving data as part of your hybrid or multi-cloud strategy. Or maybe you're retiring some legacy infrastructure, in which case you need to move the data off of it uh, before you do that retiring. And to be able to do all of these amazing things, you need often, as a first step, to move your data. And what I often find, at least in my conversations with customers, is that it's easy to look at this and say, oh, that's easy. That's the easiest part. Uh, you know, We'll deal with that later. But often, it's much harder than it looks. Sometimes you have so much data, petabytes and petabytes of data, the first problem is w figuring out what data you have. And which, of that, which subset of that data am I actually going to transfer? And then maybe, let's say you figured out what data you want to move, but you don't have enough bandwidth to move it. Or maybe you've done both of these things, but now getting access to data is the problem. It's behind a firewall. You need to get internal approvals. These are all challenges that you have to face when you're moving your data. And then finally, sometimes you just may not have the org resources. There's nobody available to actually say, move the data now. What we aim to do with our transfer product suite is to provide you a set of solutions that are simple, reliable, and secure, and hopefully remove uh, or at least minimize some of these barriers uh, to transferring your data. Now, most successful transfer projects don't start from moving your first byte. In fact, they start well before that in constructing a good transfer plan. Uh, and with that, I'd like to invite my colleague Scott up to the stage from Unity 3D. Uh, Scott's team uh, recently conducted a very large transfer project. And he's here to tell you a little bit about how you can make a great plan and ensure success from your transfer project. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Scott, and I work for Unity Technologies. I'm a DevOps engineer on the cloud team, and we recently utilized a uh, storage transfer service to move a large amount of files from S3 to GCS. So what do we do? Unity is the creator of the world's most widely used real-time 3D development platform. And what were we transferring? 500 plus terabytes of many files varying in size from S3 to GCS. Unity was in the process of migrating many service structure, infrastructure components to GCP. So we had several challenges and requirements, and one of our first requirements was no downtime for our customers. Uh, another uh, requirement was ensuring that all of our files made it to the end bucket. We had some files, actually many files, that had an older legacy naming pattern, so we had to take extra precaution to make sure all of them arrived. So some of, the some of the requirements, or actually the challenges we had, were updating our service code prior to handle this no downtime scenario. We also couldn't use the web console for this because of the complexity and the number of files. So we utilized the STS API directly, which helped us keep track of the actual transfers as they were, as they were happening. So how did we organize as a team? First of all, another team in Unity had already done a transfer project. Theirs was slightly less complicated because they had naming conventions that were consistent. So we essentially took some of the code that they had, some wrapper scripts, and, and tailored, them, tailored them to our needs. So our devs did a service code prep to deal with where to read and where to write files during this process. 
And so DevOps prepared scripts to test these transfers from, from our dev and stage environments before the final production run. So once the developers deployed the code, we, just, we did the storage transfers from dev and stage, and we did things like transfer speed times, um, logging any errors recorded in test runs to pave way for final production use. So some of the tactics we used that led up to this transfer event, speed tests were performed for transferring the files. We did it in both regional and multi-regional buckets. The end bucket was multi-regional for us. So we also tested a few transfers with smaller data in buckets that were in the same regions or close to the uh, S3 and GCS regions. The final process was from regional, actually we transferred from regional to regional and then inside of GCS we did multi-regional transfer. So some of our key takeaways and best practices, these transfers can be complicated, so devs and DevOps work together to break down the process. Also, I suggest if your team can, find any internal experts that have done this transfer before, because you can learn from what they've, they've gone through and maybe adapt your transfer to their, uh, from their, their transfer. So how to prep for the transfer. Uh, do lots of testing. So testing will help you understand what to do in case you have problems in the production run. It also gives you a good benchmark for performance. It also may predict, uh, impact your production code, so know what your workload is. Also, consider the cost of transfer. We transferred over public internet from S3, so you, know, you have egress costs. Uh, some best practices, evaluate all your transfer options. Also consider temporary regional buckets um, for your uh, sync before you go multi-regional. So if you have to sync again, you can have time to sync to your single regional bucket and then decide you know, what to do from there. Have a really good plan. Uh, another final suggestion is have service accounts ready with STS roles. You're limited to a certain number of jobs per day, so if you run out of jobs, you can always use one of your other service accounts that are ready for the process. And most of all, prepare for any issues or mistakes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Scott, um, uh, for sharing uh, some of your experiences from your transfer project. Um, uh, so one of the questions that will come up as part of your transfer planning, uh, or a very common question that comes up, is how long is my transfer going to take? Now, there's a big component of that, which is you know, what Scott just talked about. All of the process, organizational work, testing, and prep leading up to the transfer event. Um, that's a big portion of the time for a transfer uh, project to complete. But once you've gone beyond that, um, uh, if you're talking just about, I have some data here, I have some bytes, and I need to move them over there, you know, typically there are two big factors that drive uh, transfer times. You know, the first is how much data are you going to move, and what bandwidth do you have to move it? So just to get a sense from people in the room, and I'll try my best to see your hands with this light, um, how many people in this room have a connection to the public internet or to Google Cloud directly that's more than 100 megabits per second? OK, a few hands are up. Uh, how many of you have a connection that is faster than one gigabits per second? OK, just one or two people. OK, one last question. How many of you have no idea how fast your connection is to GCP or the public internet? OK, a lot of you. So uh, for those of you that are in that uh, bucket, you already know one of the questions that you need to start asking. Now, based on the answers to these questions, you can get a pretty wide spectrum of outcomes. Your transfers can take anywhere from minutes or hours to many days or even weeks. So it's important to understand this upfront, and it helps you clarify uh, what options you should consider. Now, another way to think about this is to uh, think about how close, quote unquote, or far your data is based on your bandwidth. So on the very left-hand side of this spectrum here is data that you could consider close to you. So say, for instance, you're moving data within Google Cloud, you know, between two Google Cloud data centers. That's going to go over a very high bandwidth pipe that Google has provisioned. And so even if you're moving a large amount of data, it's going to show up pretty fast. In that sense, that data is pretty close to you. Whenever you need it, you can get it. Whereas on the other end of the spectrum, let's say you have a data center outpost on a mountaintop. It has a satellite link, 
you know, that's really slow, or maybe it has no connection to the internet at all, in which case, even a small amount of data will take a long time to get to you. And so that is kind of uh, a way to think about data that's far away. So this is the spectrum on which we're thinking about uh, talking, uh, talking through uh, the options that are available for moving data in Google today. So we'll start with the leftmost, which is data that's close to you with the cloud storage transfer service. Now, this product is specifically optimized to move data from other clouds into GCP. Uh, for instance, if you're moving data from S3 into GCS. Uh, and it's used for a lot of different purposes. Uh, customers sometimes use it for archival and backup as part of their multi-cloud strategy. Sometimes they'll use it uh, as part of an analytical workload. They'll load data from S3 into GCS and then put it into BigQuery or run uh, some of our machine learning products against it. Um, or they might be uh, just moving data within GCS, you know, uh, moving between a GCS bucket in one region to another. Now, uh, today, this product supports pulling data from S3, GCS, and any web addressable HTTP data source. It can move data you know, just one time, or you can set it up to run transfers every day. Like every day at 6 o'clock, move my data over, please. Uh, and it's supported wherever GCS works today. So what I'll go through now is just a quick walkthrough of how this product works. Uh, it's a pretty simple product. Um, first, to find it, uh, you go into Cloud Console, uh, our web GUI, and you go into Storage, and underneath there will be an option called Transfer. If you click on that, you'll have the option to create a transfer. Uh, pretty, pretty straightforward. And when you create a transfer, we're going to ask you for three things. What data do you want to move? Where do you want to move it? And when do you want to move it? That's it. Uh, so the first thing, what data do you want to move? So this in, in this example, we're moving data from an S3 bucket. So we'll ask you for your bucket name, your access credentials, so we can read the data. Uh, and then we also have some optional filters you can give us. So if, for instance, you wanted to move only the files that were modified last week, we can filter that out and only move that data for you. The second step is to tell us where do you want to move this data, which is very similar to the first step. Just tell us what GCS bucket you want to move the data into. As simple as that. Uh, and then finally, you tell us when you want to move the data. You can start moving the data right now, once you hit done. Um, or you can schedule it to run nightly, as I mentioned before, uh, if you want to have this be a continuous process. So it's just that simple. And once you kick this off, there is a uh, reporting uh, uh, GUI that will help you track, you know, OK, where are all your transfers, how much data has been moved, how much data needs is left. If there are any errors, you can go look up the errors and resolve them. Uh, and it's just that simple. No provisioning to do, no other setup. Just give us your credentials, tell us these three things, and you're ready to go. Now, the next step on the spectrum is if, let's say, your data is a little bit further away. So perhaps it's a networking link that's provisioned by your colo or you provisioned yourself uh, at your corporate office data center. Uh, so it might be a little bit slower. Uh, for that, uh, we have a product called uh, GSUtil. Now, GSUtil is uh, designed to move data from your data center that you operate into Google Cloud. It's a command line utility, which means you can use it in an ad hoc basis in your day-to-day -day workflows, just invoke it from the shell. Um, or you can put it in a script as part of a cron job. It works like any other uh, command line utility. Um, you can also run it in a continuous mode. So you can run it in the background. It'll sit and listen on a directory. And whenever new data comes in or data is updated, it'll push that data to a GCS bucket. Now, in addition uh, to these two modes, a continuous sync and copy, it also supports streaming. So if you have a Unix command you're running, you can pipe it to GSUtil, and it'll stream the output to a GCS object. Um, underneath the covers, it also supports uh, uh, automatic retries, encryption, and GCS object versioning. Now, GSUtil has a lot of options. Um, I'm going to go through a few that uh, I've found in my experience uh, customers find to be pretty useful. Um, uh, so let's just walk through those now. So the first is, how do I get this to go fast? One option I always recommend is to use the dash M flag for GSUtil. What this triggers is that it runs the GSUtil process in a multi-threaded mode so that many, many threads inside the GSUtil process are pushing many files in parallel to the cloud. Uh, you almost always want to use this. Now, let's say that's not enough. 
let's say you have uh, you know running GSUtil and it's using up three gigabits per second of your bandwidth. It's pretty good, uh, but you have a ten gigabits per second link. So how do I use up my bandwidth? Um, so what we recommend there is to run GSUtil across multiple hosts or multiple processes. Uh, what you would do is partition your data up front, and then you'd kick off multiple GSUtil uh, command line invocations to run the data transfer in parallel. So for instance, uh, I run GSUtil on directory one, subdirectory one, then I run GSUtil on subdirectory two, and then I run GSUtil on subdirectory three on machine number two. And all those GSUtils will run in parallel, and that way you can fill up your pipe. Now let's say you do this. You're still going to have one other problem. What if I have a really big file, a 100 gigabyte file? Well, it's going to get mapped to one thread in one of these GSUtil processes, and I've got to just sit there and wait for that thread to finish. That's going to take forever. So for that scenario, we have a, a feature called parallel composite uploads. And what it will do is for large files, It'll break those files up into chunks and transfer the chunks in parallel so you don't get bottlenecked on large files in your transfer. Uh, now I'll just go through a few other assorted tips and tricks uh, with this tool. Uh, the first is controlling bandwidth. So in some situations, uh, some customers will say, I want to be able to limit how much bandwidth GSUtil uses so that I can preserve some of my bandwidth for my existing loads, in my, in my existing workloads in my data center. Uh, and unfortunately, GSUtil has no native support, but you can use command line utilities like Trickle to control how much bandwidth uh, GSUtil is using. A uh, second common ask is when you're, especially if you're doing archival, is I want to save my file metadata. How do I do that? So you can use the dash P option on GSUtil, which will preserve all of your POSIX metadata into GCS object metadata. So it'll preserve that for you. And then finally, uh, for people that are worried about accidental uh, overwrites, you can use the dash n option. And that'll, that'll ensure that if a GCS object already exists, GSUtil will not overwrite it. So if that's a concern, if someone fat fingers something, or you just want to make sure you never lose data, that's something you should look into. Now, as I said before, GSUtil has a lot of options. This is just a very small uh, subset of them. If you're curious to learn more, I suggest you go and look at our online web documentation on GSUtil, which is a pretty comprehensive listing of all the things that GSUtil can do. And with that, let me hand it off to my colleague, Ben, who will talk about some other transfer options. Thanks. Thanks, Ash. All right, so that's me. I'm another product manager on the Google transfer team. All right, so we have talked about uh, cloud transfer service for cloud-to-cloud -cloud transfers. We have talked about GSUtil uh, for on-prem to cloud transfers, uh, where you have a reasonable network connectivity. Uh, what about um, locations where you don't have network connectivity or not enough? Um, we have a lot of customers who uh, do e-commerce, who serve content from their data centers. Um, so you would think that a lot of them will have you know, enough bandwidth to upload like terabytes of data to cloud. The reality is that, that they use all that bandwidth for production use, right? To serve content, to run e-commerce. Uh, you don't want to suck up all that bandwidth to upload a few hundred terabytes of data to the cloud and bring down your whole system and your business as well. Um, and um, the other option is, well, why can't we just uh, provision more bandwidth? It's not as easy as that, right? Uh, because of cost, of time, uh, you have to sign maybe a two-year agreement with your ISP. Um, and if you are just doing a one-time transfer, it's probably not worth it. Uh, so that's where we talk about the offline transfer use case. Uh, for situations where you have very little network bandwidth or you have no bandwidth at all. For example, you have a data center up in a mountain somewhere. Um, and uh, Google's product is called Transfer Appliance. Uh, so the picture um, of the appliance that you see here is a 2U storage server. It can be racked in your data center. It has a usable capacity of about 80 terabytes. Um, and this is, um, is really inexpensive. We ship it to you overnight. You, know, you rack it, load data to it, ship it back to us, and we'll upload the data for you. Um, before I go into use cases, the picture here is of our bigger appliances. Uh, of our bigger appliance, it's a 4U form factor, um, usable capacity about 400 terabytes. Um, this is a pretty big box, um, so most of our customers will have this sitting uh, on their data center floor. 
Um, so let's talk about use cases. Um, number one use case here, which we encounter very often, uh, is where customers um, really like the idea of running their workloads in cloud, machine learning, data analytics, and so on and so forth. Um, but then they run into a chicken and egg problem. Right? You have all that data. Um, you cannot convince your CIO or CEO to fund like larger network pipes. So how do you get all that data to cloud to prove that you know, cloud has value for your company? So we have customers who order an appliance, just a small one, TA100, um, ship us 70 terabytes of data, run ML, run some data analytics, say, hey, you know, it works, right? There's real value for the business, and that's where the, um, they get agreement from management to invest in more network bandwidth and, and so on and so forth. Um, other use cases, including seeding backups to cloud, and we'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, data center migration, uh, large archival moves. So um, where you are shutting down a data center, you may want to move all the data to cloud before you actually shut it down and, and uh, you know, obsolete your old servers. All right, so how do you get one? Um, the transfer appliance service is now available in the US and Canada. Uh, it's also available in the EU. Um, you basically order the appliance uh, online on Cloud Console um, under the storage uh, section, um, and you basically fill up this thing. If this is, uh, you know, how, how you fill it up. Uh, there's a contact email that's kind of optional, but um, how we work this service is that it's not automated at the back, right? So what I like to say is that there's a human being behind the service. So they, that's a nice thing because, um, like Ash was saying earlier, moving a lot of data is not easy. Right, it is not something that we want. To, we don't want to ship you the appliance and you know, like go figure it out. So we would like to work with our customers hand in hand to make sure that your data moves are successful. Um, again, the onboarding process is very easy. Right, you request an appliance, we ship it to you. You fill it up, ship it back to us. We will upload the data for you, um, and then you figure out where you want to put it in cloud. Um, one note: uh, How many Canadians are here in the room? No, I don't see anybody. Oh, one, okay. Um, so how this works for Canada is that um, the data upload will be based in the US. We haven't set up uh, a center in uh, Canada yet. So we ship you the appliance, you ship it back to us in the US, we will upload the data. Um, and in case you're worried about security, the next two slides from now we'll talk about that. Um, okay, so set up a configuration is uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, this is a standard server, like those of you who are familiar with uh, IT hardware, um, the picture that you see here is the back of the big server, um, standard power connectors, um, standard copper Ethernet connectors, and we also support fiber optic. Uh, we do provide the uh, SFP plus transceivers. Um, there are some uh, bandwidth incompatibilities across different standards, so we'll work with you to figure out whether what we provide is sufficient for your network. Uh, and we also support network aggregation. Right? So you see here there are four uh, network ports, so we can run as fast as 40 gigs per second. So network is not a bottleneck. Um, and talking about bottlenecks, um, a lot of times when we work with customers who have lots of very small files, they, um, they kind of complain that you know, copying files from the existing file servers, Isilon, NetApps are too slow. Uh, it is mainly because of the you know, billions of small files that they're trying to pull out. This is something that uh, customers will have to deal with, um, right? kind of like reading data from the files. Um, obviously, once the data has been read up from the original file systems, um, everything else is pretty quick. Okay, so let's talk, talking about security. Um, the key point here is data is always encrypted at rest and transit. Um, we, Google, don't need the keys to upload your data. So customers keep and control your keys. The data is encrypted when it's copied onto the appliance, and customers will decrypt the data in their own GCP project once the data has been uploaded. Um, and then what happens to the appliance after you ship it back to us? Uh, and after the data has been uploaded, we do a secure wipe of all the drives. We reinstall the OS and applications for the next customer. So it's like getting a new appliance. So a quick security summary. Um, so you own, right, you the customer owns the encryption keys. You manage that. Uh, data is always encrypted in transit. Uh, we upload the encrypted data into what we call a staging bucket, and then you decrypt that. 
uh, within your own GCP project, and then we wipe the appliances. Uh, wipe certificates are available, obviously, uh, for for a lot of customers. They find it's very important, right, for audit purposes. Uh, with that, I'd like to hand you off to Deepak, who will talk about one of the use cases uh, for transfer appliance. Hi, my name is Deepak Verma. I'm a director of product management at Commvault, and uh, we're one of the vendors that support uh, transfer appliance uh, on-prem. So I'll start at 10,000 foot level. Um, this is kind of our blueprint, blueprint architecture of what we can uh, perform with uh, Google Cloud. So um, break down the architecture on the left side. We've got a lot of customers that are running uh, various uh, type of workloads, it could be VM workloads, databases, applications, not just flat files that need, may need to get transferred. Uh, you got Commvault components, we call it the VSA, um, that's capable of transferring or writing that data into a GCS bucket uh, directly. Uh, transfer appliance is something that we uh, supported recently uh, as a mechanism to transfer large amounts of data, and I'll get into kind of w one versus the other one. Once you're in GC GCP, you've got a number of options that you can uh, uh, can use. First off, uh, we can, you can obviously protect GCU workloads, virtual machines, and applications within those workloads, just as they were uh, you would on an on-prem environment and write it to GCS bucket. Other, other um, components of GCP that we support are file store, so you can back that up as, as though it were an on-prem NAS and write that again, uh, that data to GCS. Within GCS, you support tiering just like you would an on-prem, you would write to a standard tier data, and then maybe after a, a period of time, you want to move that to cheaper storage, to deeper archive, you can move that to a cold line. So you've got flexibility to do that. And one of the things that I put on there is actually protection to from. So not only can you read the data from GCS, but you can also write to GCS. In other words, GCS protection. So I want to double click on the transfer appliance component and talk through use cases the customers have, uh, have uh, brought up to us. So the first one is migration of uh, of existing data. So what this means is there may be hundreds of terabytes or petabytes of data that may be sitting on-prem. Typically, where we've seen it is elimination of those uh, long-term silos. Some industries have seven-year retention, others have up to, you know, up to 30-year retention that they must maintain data. And today, it's sitting in, in tape libraries, it could be sitting in virtual tape libraries, it could be sitting in dedupe appliances, and they want to move that to, to cloud. So going back to Ash's comment earlier, it just doesn't make sense to put uh, hundreds of gigabits of network connectivity to get that transfer done. So this is where appliance comes in, um, comes in handy. So the use case there ends up becoming what we call an auxiliary copy, which is basically making a copy of that data, putting it onto a transfer appliance, and then bringing it up into GCS. The second use case is seeding. So maybe it's a net new project um, where they want to uh, forego old data. So we're going to start backing up to GCS. Uh, however, for the amount of data that we have, uh, there's no option to perform a full. So I'll, I'll get to an example here pretty shortly, but the full would take uh, a considerable amount of time. And you want to size your bandwidth for that full capacity because you're not going to be doing full backups on a daily basis. So I call, I call this kind of a full or a, a baseline backup. The third use case is, is pretty interesting. It's popped up uh, more and more is, is air-gapped. And this is more for ransomware protection, where you truly want a copy of data that is not tied into your production network. So there are cases where customers have actually put their data into a GCS bucket, knowing that they can recover in cloud if uh, they, are, they ever hit that in eventuality. The benefit that you get from, uh, from a, a backup product uh, driving that is, Obviously, you're overcoming bandwidth limitations with integration of transfer appliance, but you get the benefit of deduplication and compression uh, as opposed to just copying the data flat, if you will. You have the ability to perform encryption, so you know Ben mentioned encryption. Uh, however, you can still do encryption at that level, so if your backup data is already encrypted, that encryption transfers through. And the, and the other benefit, if you remember the architecture from the previous slide, you don't need any, any additional appliances or gateways in order to actually move the data to transfer appliance. So uh, it, it becomes a seamless. So we, we treat, from an architecture standpoint, transfer appliance as though it were an on-prem GCS bucket. And where that comes in handy is that once the data has been moved to GCS, then it, you don't have to worry about having to change formats on that one. So, it drive and you know adding a little few components to uh, to bend steps here so I changed it from you know four steps to eight steps you you perform the ordering you do the setup etc 
And then there's a, there's a component of what to transfer. So within the Commvault infrastructure, you can actually run reports that'll tell you about the data itself, when it's been touched, what files it is. So you can really select uh, what specifically you want to transfer. Here, typically what customers have gone for is they'll select uh, you know any, anything beyond 30 days. So they'll consider zero to 30 day or zero to 14 days operational recovery, things that they need on-prem to recover immediately. But then beyond that, they're maintaining long-term retention and they want to transfer that type of data or they're going after large static files. So you can run reports against that. When you transfer the data, you've got two options, as I mentioned earlier. You've got the ability to do an auxiliary copy, which basically means it's sitting in a backup format somewhere, VTL, tape library, et cetera, and you want to make a copy of that copy, or it's a full backup that you're baselining. The, uh, the next step ends up being disabling any further writes. So once the, appliance is the transfer appliance is full, we want to completely disable any rights and data aging. Why? Because it's going to take some time to transfer the actual physical appliance, to ship it, to stage the data out. And in that meantime, if you've got policies set up that uh, may want to expire data based on your SLAs or um, your business requirements, it w it's not going to be able to find that appliance. So that's something to, to keep in mind. The other aspect is what happens to daily transfers. And, uh, one of the things that we've found is that it's very beneficial to have the daily transfers, especially if GCS is going to be your ultimate target, to actually have those sent to, uh, to GCS as incrementals. Um, and, I'll, and I'll get to uh, a little bit more on that one. So we sh then you ship the appliance, you rehydrate the, the data, as uh, Ben described earlier. Uh, from there, once, once the data actually ends up in, a G in your GCS bucket within GCP, all you have to do within the Convolute interface is actually flip a bit to tell it that now you're writing in a cloud library as opposed to a pseudo cloud library that uh, was emulated on the transfer appliance. And why this is important is because we're going to use your credentials and your roles within GCS in, in order to get access to that data and to write new data. Uh, you enable writes and data aging, so we can treat that as though it were your data sitting within, within GCS. And you can do a test restore, uh, rec highly recommended, and then you can continue using uh, GCS for your incremental backups. So um, first, real, high, uh, real quick high-level best practices. Uh, from a deduplication standpoint, uh, one of the things that we found uh, with, uh, with cloud storage is we can use very large deduplication sizes because we can do range reads within those blocks of data. So where we've seen uh, customers trip, uh, trip up, especially when transferring data, is on-prem, they may be used to writing a much smaller deduplication block size. However, when they transfer that data as an auxiliary copy into, into cloud, it's not optimized. So then you have to kind of do a rehydration and then a deduplication um, over. So the first time around to transfer appliance, it's beneficial to just have the right uh, large block size for deduplication set. So it's one of the, one of the best practices. The other one is to uh, definitely disable the backups and data aging. What that helps with is uh, not upsetting your SLAs on-prem. That was the system is aware that uh, that, that data is going to be inaccessible for, for a period of time. And uh, one of the benefits you get is we, you don't have to, with the, with the platform, um, have the fulls sitting, readable, available in order to you, for you to continue doing incrementals. So obviously, from a restore perspective, you've got to be aware of that. And by disabling it, then you'll know what restores are, are not available. Um, and then sufficient bandwidth for interim and daily incrementals. And really, this is the sizing question of, uh, do I want to size for, for peak or do I want to size for incrementals? So you still want to consider your incrementals and start writing those incrementals straight to GCS. So what I really mean by that, I illustrated on, on the right side. So for super simplification, let's assume you've got 500 terabytes of data. You've got a gigabit bandwidth uh, available to do the transfer. And let's say you've got about 2% change rate of net new data coming in. Uh, one option is you write the 500 terabytes as is through the transfer appliance. Or if you were to do it over the network, that would take about 51 days to, to, uh, to transfer the data. You de 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 deduplicate it and compress it. That ends up being uh, about 100 terabytes, which you could write in, in 10 days over the network. But then what you have to worry about is in those 10 days, there's going to be change rate generated, which means then you have to recursively catch up on that and recursively catch up on the next and the next and the next. And of course, we're assuming there's no growth. 
So the, the, the idea here is that th that 100 terabytes deduplicated and compressed is written into the transfer appliance, the transfer appliance to put on the truck and sent across. Let's assume it takes two weeks to get that data to show up in your GCS bucket. Uh, so in those 14 days, you've generated another 28 terabytes worth of data. So now you're kind of at the, the position that you were earlier, which is how do I transfer that? Do I do it over the network? Do I get another transfer appliance? So you don't want to do either one, uh, preferably. What you want to do is at the bottom where you're actually sending your incrementals, which, which is two terabytes, considering it's 2%, to GCS directly. So now we're talking about, mathematically, about five hours to transfer that data. So you think of it as two buckets. You'll, have, you'll end up with one bucket that has your fulls or your, your auxiliary copied data, and you'll have your second bucket, which will have your incremental data. And from a, a platform perspective, there's no... No complication, no issue in, uh, for the system to be able to pick up where the data lives. So if you want to be able to do, do a restore, it knows that to read from bucket one, an incremental bit from, from, uh, from your new bucket versus from your old bucket in order to pull that. So the, the important aspect here is that, that 28 terabytes are three days because you're generating that data while the, uh, while the appliance is on the, on the truck. And then you can finally catch up. So the, the better approach really is at the bottom where you're just sending incrementals straight to GCS over your network. And what that ends up being is, yeah, I can, I can size my, I can keep my network at a, at a gigabit. I don't have to uh, provision uh, an immense amount of bandwidth just to account for the 500 terabytes, which would be a one-time transfer. And hopefully you never have to transfer the 500 terabytes back, so you never really have to worry about that. Ben? Thanks, Deepang. All right, so just a quick summary. Um, so we have a uh, cloud transfer service for cloud-to-cloud -cloud transfers, uh, GS Util for on-prem to cloud transfers if you have enough bandwidth, uh, and obviously if you don't have enough bandwidth, there's transfer points.